I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Jeremy Larson. Uh, he has uh, joined City of Hope uh, Phoenix in November 2022, where he serves as the assistant clinical professor in the Department of Hematology and Hematopoietic Stem Cell Transplantation. Uh, he is involved in patient care and clinical research for multiple myeloma, lichen amyloidosis, and related disorders. And he has served as a primary investigator for numerous investigational studies for multiple myeloma and AL amyloidosis. He graduated from Creighton University School of Medicine and completed internal medicine residency and hematology oncology fellowship at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Okay, well, thank you very much. And yeah, packed house. I'm uh, delighted to see this. And so I think this is a good sign that we're starting to move the needle in the right direction uh, in terms of awareness and obviously excitement about amyloidosis. So. You know, as a hematologist, the disclaimer is when I, when I use the word amyloid, I'm likely referring to AL, um, unless I, I specify otherwise. So, you know, we're going to take you through a few clinical cases today. I, I will feel, I, I would say, I feel like amyloidosis is a, uh, a disease that some of the, you know, the, the troubleshooting that can happen in these kinds of talks is education. We, we kind of need to know what tests to do, but I think also as kind of engineering the system, you know, from a, a nomenclature standpoint of the testing. I'll try to clarify some of this because I think we all, you know, know I need to order an SPEP, I need to order a free light chain. But it turns out there are lab orders for total light chains instead of free light chains. And so there's lots of little little snags that we'll kind of try to highlight as we walk through this. So making sure we're getting the right testing at the, at the right time. So a few disclosures listed there. Um, so we'll walk you through uh, a common clinical scenario where screen would be indicated. We'll talk a little bit more about the options for testing uh, and then kind of go through that algorithm when amyloidosis is suspected. So as many of you are aware, you know, MGUS or this monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, that mouthful is extremely prevalent. Um, so depending on the, the patient population you're screening, older patients 65 and above, anywhere from 3 to 4 percent. And if we go into patients of African descent, that may actually be as high as even 6 to 7 percent incidence. So extremely, extremely common. And when we talk about the kind of slice of the pie here, um, you know, it's hard to give you a specific uh, number, but you know, at least probably three and a half million and above, you know, with MGUS, uh, many of those patients are unaware they have it. Whereas we talk about kind of the end organ, you know, uh, complications that develop from a disease like multiple myeloma, that's a tiny slice of the pie. And as hematologists, I think we all have a little bit of, um, you know, I'd say, I guess, blood on our hands from a perspective of the late recognition of AL. I can't tell you how many times in my not that long of career that, um, you know, patients are followed for years in a hematology clinic and they're tuned in for looking for crab symptoms, the hypercalcemia, the, you know, the anemia, the bone lesions. And all the time, this patient has ongoing nephrosis, uh, nephrotic syndrome and, and um, nephropathy, et cetera. And so kind of being tuned into you know, these other complications from plasma cell disorder. So not going to obviously belabor, you know, uh, the plasma cell um, in, in great, great detail, but I think some knowledge of, of what we're kind of talking about, you know, can help, uh, you know, really be aware of, of what the, what the cell we're, we're dealing with is here. So a plasma cell, as you may recall from early, you know, education is essentially a B cell that's sort of gone to postgraduate school. It's a B cell that's been activated by some form of exposure. It saw an antigen. A T cell activation, I kind of sometimes joke that sort of, uh, you know, plasma cell development is essentially nature's first two-factor authentication. Essentially, it gets exposed to something, a T cell activates it, um, and so we're now using that technology, but this is something, you know, our bodies have done for a long time. Um, if you look at the actual, you know, function of a plasma cell, these are protein immunoglobulin synthesis powerhouses, and so that, you know, kind of design you know, term of, you know, form follows function. The plasma cell is a perfect example of that. So you may recall this, this kind of pale area right outside of the nucleus, we call the HOF. It's loaded with Golgi apparatus and endoplasmic reticulum. These are pumping out uh, proteins, immunoglobulins, or the other term that you're probably familiar with would be antibodies. So the structure of an antibody, and I'll get to why we're talking about this in just a second, um, is this Y-shaped construct. And at the, the kind of business end, at the, the arms of the Y is the antigen binding site. And that's you know, really designed to, to uh, recognize millions of different uh, antigens. So that's something that's variable. Uh, and then that's attached there to the, the heavy chain construct. And so at the, 
you know, the arms, we have the light chain, uh, the antigen binding site, and we have the, what we call the FC fragment, which ultimately, once an antibody binds to something, activates our, um, you know, uh, effector cells, things like NK cells, macrophages, et cetera. Um, and so we have five different types of immunoglobulins. You probably remember this from boards as well. Um, so the key things we see clinically, as you heard earlier today, IgG, IgA are the most common variants, but we actually do see uh, rarely IgM-related amyloidosis. It has a little bit different phenotype, and I think that's in large part due when you see this IgM pentamer. It's, it's, a, it's a, a gigantic protein construct, and so we tend to see more incidence of especially those profound um, neuropathy complications in our IgM amyloidosis patients. So many of these patients also have um, Waldenstrom's, uh, for example, a little bit less tendency for cardiac involvement, uh, but definitely more soft tissue neuropathy and oftentimes renal involvement that can be very challenging to treat. So we'll kind of get into the, the business here and make it real for you. So, you know, we'll kind of put on our clinician caps here. And so, you know, we're walking into our, our first uh, patient of the day. So in this, uh, you know, example, you know, gentlemen, from, you know, very, very, I would say, representative of our patient population. So, so, you know, near Medicare age, he's got some metabolic syndrome, he's overweight, he works a, de a sedentary desk job, he's uh, diabetic, hyperlipidemia, hypertension. Notes, uh, you know, he's not quite doing as well on his diet as he should be. His A1C is suboptimal. When you look at some of the symptoms, he's got mild grade one um, distal neuropathy, uh, primarily in the toes, a little bit of the balls of the feet. You know, going up a, a couple flights of stairs or up a hill, he is short of breath, um, no chest pain. CBC is unremarkable. He's got maybe a mild renal impairment, trace microalbuminuria, uh, TTE is done. Grade one diastolic dysfunction EF looks normal. So the question is, do we, is this the patient that we need to go down this diagnostic pathway? Uh, and I would argue, obviously from a, a you know, utilization standpoint, there's gonna be a lot of uh, MGUS screening for this type of patient if, if we're doing that. So, you know, as you heard earlier today, you know, some of the patterns that we're gonna talk about, it kind of, you know, depends on the severity, depends on if there are other clinical factors that, that could easily explain their neuropathy. So in this gentleman, you know, we have uh, diabetes that can likely explain his, his trace microalbuminuria and, you know, some of the other changes we're seeing here. So I would argue that's probably not the patient that needs screened. So we'll walk to our next door uh, neighbor here, our second patient of the day. We're feeling good after the first one. Um, so this is now an 81-year-old woman. Very, you know, high functional status, but has developed somewhat unexplained um, edema of the lower extremities and also now is starting to have kind of a weeping ulcer over her right lower leg. Um, she's a kind of a, a second opinion for you. She's already seen a vascular specialist. They've worked her up for PAD. They've looked into possible IV com uh, IVC compression that's negative. And so she, at this point, is now a year into this. She's gone through wound care, et cetera, et cetera. This keeps happening. She's on diuretics, but the edema is not going away. Um, and so in this example, um, you know, we're, we're going to kind of walk six months forward now. We won't say what was, was done then, but um, six months later, there's now a TTE uh, that's updated, and she has a new pericardial effusion. So as you heard earlier today, that should probably be a red flag. She goes through a pericardiocentesis. Cytology is negative for malignancy, so we're, we're, we're happy about that. The TTE outside report is un <clears throat> unrevealing as it's, as it's kind of carried forward in the, the progress notes. Turns out, you know, she had been sort of labeled with HEFPEF, essentially. Um, and a well-intentioned provider says, I'm gonna screen for amyloid. So good, they thought about it. They did that first step, bravo. Second step, unfortunately, is where they got tripped up. So they ordered an SPEP. Uh, and as you heard nicely earlier today, that's not enough. Um, but unfortunately, they anchored to this. They said this isn't amyloid, HEFPEP is negative. So six months pass by, symptoms continue to get worse. This is actually where I met the patient two years into her journey. Um, and at this point, she has profound paresthesias of the feet, painful neuropathy, autonomic dysfunction, gets dizzy and falls when she stands. She was previously independent. She's a widow, and she is now in a, a care facility because she's uh, unable to care for herself. And with even walking to the bathroom, she's short of breath. And uh, so I actually met this patient in the hospital because uh, she had new oxygen requirements. This is what her legs looked like. Um, so not, not good. Um, and so the diagnostic testing that then is carried forward, this is kind of textbook AL, and unfortunately this patient is way too far downstream where 24 months before we probably could have done a lot to help this woman. 
She has all the classic manifestations, low voltage, uh, QRS, her TTE at moderate to severe, concentric increased LV wall thickness. She still has the pericardial effusion. She's anemic. She has renal impairment. Her albumin is low, uh, and she has predicted about four grams a day of albuminuria. The SPEP, still negative. Uh, and actually, in this case, the serum immunofixation was also negative. Sometimes that will pick up um, kind of dimerized light chains, so it's not uncommon to see a monoclonal kappa or a monoclonal lambda on immunofixation. We'll talk a little bit more about what this test is. Uh, but in her case, it was the free light chains that really were, were kind of what, what gave us the diagnosis. So her lambda free light chains were quite elevated, and, and not all patients will have a, um, light chains to this degree. So in this case, 32.4 uh, milligram per deciliter, so that's about 15-fold higher than normal. Her ratio is suppressed. If you want to flip that as a hematologist, we oftentimes think about the, what we call the DFLC, the difference between the involved light chain, which in her case would be lambda minus uninvolved. So if you subtract those two, 30.7, so that's very high. Her bone marrow biopsy is done. She has a plasma cell dyscrasia, 9%, lambda restricted. Uh, our fish is positive for one of the most common cytogenetic abnormalities we see in amyloid patients, which is a, a rearrangement of the 11th and 14th chromosome. Um, and this is also highlights what we heard earlier as well, that the bone marrow biopsy is not the end-all be-all for screening for amyloidosis. So her report was, was read as equivocal, uh, but it highlights, and I think you're going to hear more about this in, in, a, in a little, the next talk as well, uh, but from some of our uh, internal data, we would suggest that roughly about 50 percent of patients with AL amyloidosis may have a positive bone marrow. But on the other hand, that's going to tell you you're going to miss 50 percent of the patients if that's what you're anchoring your diagnosis on. So in her case, we also, also did an abdominal fat aspirate, and that was positive for what should be Congo red stain, um, and mass spec confirmed an amyloid subtype of, of lambda type amyloidosis. So we have a, a, a diagnosis. So in this case, the patient was profoundly, um, you know, symptomatic, and actually after long goals of care conversation, she decided to go to hospice uh, and, and passed away about six or seven weeks later. Um, so, you know, this is, this is an egregious example, obviously, of, you know, way too long went on without people kind of looking into the diagnosis in the first place, and then obviously some missed opportunities with the testing. But it, this really just kind of goes to highlight that all of us, I think, um, you know, our job is to really, you know, recognize these patients ideally far, far more upstream. And, you know, I, cardiologists in the room, you guys are, are, are huge, you know, gatekeepers for this, but, you know, our GI docs, as you, as you kind of heard a moment ago with um, you know, patients get EGDs, colonoscopies for diarrhea and malabsorption and, and still see all the time that Congo red stains aren't done. Uh, have seen a couple of examples now of someone who presents to their ENT doc with macroglossia. They get a tongue biopsy and we're applauding because no carcinoma, but they didn't do Congo red staining. And so, um, you know, I, I think there's lots and lots of, of examples of these kind of things, but I'd say if there's one thing we can, we can really do better as a medical community, would be early, early diagnosis because therapy really can change these patients' lives. But as you, as you kind of heard, once, once the, the kind of cat uh, is sort of, uh, you know, out of the barn, that's not the expression at all. But the, we'll, we'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to coin a new one here. <laughs> We're going to go with that. Uh, so, you know, obviously there's, there's sometimes limited therapy, what we could do. So, so these are just some of the patterns. We're going to talk a little bit about this. I, I highlighted this slide specifically uh, because of that lower panel. I don't know how well that shows up, but the, the soft tissue involvement, so those ulcerations, those non-healing ulcers of or lower extremities, likely were in part due to the edema, but also, um, you know, we also will see soft tissue kind of plaques and ulcerations sometimes form. You know, from a GI tract uh, perspective, there's the autonomic standpoint of uh, the dysmotility, et cetera, but also um, many of these patients have friability, and so we'll see kind of that, um, you know, the, uh, the coagulation deficits uh, also can, can manifest with the easy bruising, you know, and high ALK FOS, hepatomegaly, uh, Dr. Rosenthal and I should kind of share a patient who is a gentleman who was having uh, very refractory ascites, getting tapped repeatedly, had a hepatomegaly, what looked like severe cirrhosis, and you know his, his liver was chock full of amyloid, and, and now several years later that patient's living a fairly normal life. Um, and so, so therapy can also be extremely helpful for these patients uh, when, we, when we recognize the diagnosis in a timely fashion. So, you know, this is just a highlight, you know, there is a disconnect between hematologic response in terms of watching those light chains go down and the time to organ response. And so, 
you know, Dr. Learn, who's a nephrologist in Rochester, uh, who has really pioneered and has kind of been, I think, a very big advocate for this term, what we'll call kind of delayed renal response. But this is a specific a case where it was a, a patient who went through an autologous stem cell transplant. That's kind of the time zero on the bar. So in this schematic, what you're seeing, the, the dotted um, you know, line there is their proteinuria. Uh, so they started roughly around 13,000 milligrams per day, and their serum albumin is the solid line there. So what you can kind of see, obviously, as the, the urine uh, protein levels drop, the serum albumin rises. But really, from a complete organ response standpoint, all the way out to three years before this patient technically you know, had normalized their their proteinuria, and oftentimes, you know, the, the NT pro BNP and the troponin follows a somewhat similar pattern, and it's very common in those first few months of therapy to see cardiac biomarkers actually rise significantly because of, you know, the added stress of the chemotherapy. So ideally, recognizing those patients earlier on in their journey, that therapy is going to go a lot, a lot more smoothly. So when to consider, you've heard a lot of this already, I'll, I'll harp on just a kind of a couple of, of things here. So, you know, when to consider screening. Proteinuria, obviously, you know, if there's no other explanation, the renal insufficiency come late, comes late. So if you're just waiting for their creatinine to rise, you've, you've probably already missed the boat. The amyloid purpura, um, so kind of termed raccoon eyes, um, you know, is one of those very pathognomonic things. We don't see it very often, but if you do, you know, obviously uh, some alarms should be going off. The neuropathy that you heard nicely from Dr. Goodman just a moment ago, the restrictive cardiomyopathy, so this hef pef -like, uh, like syndrome, and I think you know, with advances in imaging, we're, you know, hopefully labeling fewer and fewer patients with athlete's heart and these types of things. But I would say as a hematologist, one of the things that, you know, many of us don't do would be, you know, screening cardiac biomarkers. So as part of the routine follow-up for MGUS, you know, we're doing CBCs and metabolic profiles, but, um, you know, lots of patients who have shortness of breath necessarily aren't, aren't getting appropriate testing. So I, I would oftentimes advocate you know, to my colleagues that that is something that could be, you know, especially for those patients who have some of those types of symptoms, an NT uh, pro BNP can be extremely helpful. You know, the macroglossia, obviously, and then that hepatomegaly, hepatomegaly and, you know, an elevated ALK-FOS in isolation without, um, you know, the other LFTs is also a big, a big tip-off for these patients. So, you know, this is more for, you know, from my standpoint, when we have a, a monoclonal gammopathy, what are the big things that we're thinking about? As hematologists, we're all tuned in, you know, we're looking for myeloma, but, um, you know, the paraprotein-related syndromes are what I would say we, we still kind of fall short on. Um, and so, you know, these are kind of the, you know, the big, the big things that as we start this testing cascade we're thinking about. So um, it's probably once or twice a, a year that I meet a patient, they're referred for a stem cell transplant, and I start looking through their, their records. Um, and it's myeloma, it's myeloma, it's myeloma, and it's, it's because, let's say they were anemic, they had a bone marrow biopsy, 10% or more plasma cells are found, you have myeloma, we're starting therapy because, you know, you're anemic. No one really thinks about, yeah, I guess I did have some neuropathy, you know, I am, I am short of breath more than usual, et cetera. So it's very, very common that I meet patients who actually have bona fide amyloidosis. They don't have they have more than 10% plasma cells, but they have no bone lesions. They don't have the classic renal impairment. And so I put the, um, you know, the periorbital purpura here is, this is a couple of years ago uh, in my time at Mayo that I met, a woman walked in to the clinic, and, and this is maybe not quite this severe, but profound periorbital purpura, had been on treatment that was not going well for the prior three months uh, uh, outside. Um, and had never heard the words amyloidosis. She had terrible neuropathy. She had terrible autonomic dysfunction. She had periorbital purpura. But they were anchoring on the fact that he, she had more than 10% uh, bone marrow plasma cells. Um, so the diagnosis of myeloma versus amyloid really comes down to the clinical phenotype. Um, we know that, that patients with amyloid with more than 10% bone marrow plasma cells, the prognosis is inferior to those with lower clonal burden. Um, so this is probably, you know, for, for more, more directed towards my, my hematology colleagues, but, um, but just kind of food for thought. So you've heard a lot about, you know, the, the diagnosis. So really this is kind of four essential pieces. So we need a syndrome uh, that we've kind of talked a lot about. We need tissue confirmation. Um, and ideally we'd start with some form of, of staining looking for uh, the amyloid, most commonly Congo red, but uh, some facilities still do uh, electron microscopy. 
And then once we find uh, amyloid, the next key step that I would still say the adoption of is, is not where it needs to be, would be actually doing amyloid subtyping and, and that mass spec or amyloid uh, protein identification would be uh, uh, the, the key thing. Um, and then lastly, you know, we need some evidence of the monoclonal uh, plasma cell disorder. And so that's, you know, usually kind of towards the top in terms of the cascade of this, but uh, as we'll kind of talk about the laboratory evaluation, this is kind of going to be the, the first step. So the SPEP, as we call it, the serum protein electrophoresis is an old test. This is not, not new. This is a gel agarose based, essentially a, a kind of a, a Western blot style um, test. And so antibodies or immunoglobulins tend to drift into that far right portion of the graph, the gamma globulin range. And so this is a pretty normal example, but when we have a very large monoclonal protein, we tend to see almost a tower or a spike-like presentation, but the hard part with many amyloid patients, they may have a 0 0.1, a 0 0.2 monoclonal pro protein, and it doesn't stand out much on that gamma globulin uh, peak. And so that's where, you know, the sensitivity of the SPEP, it's, you know, it's still a helpful tool in my mind. We do advocate to perform it. Um, because it helps give you quantified information. It says how big is that monoclonal protein, but in, in many amyloid patients, it's small. Um, so a common question is what, you know, what is an immunofixation? Well, ultimately, uh, what it is is it's an <clears throat> immune precipitation. So this is a more of a yes-no test. It's not going to give you a number, but what it's going to tell you is what type of monoclonal protein is there, and it's the most sensitive screen we have in the blood, uh, specifically looking for you know, something like a, a heavy chain plus a light chain, so the IgG lambda, for example. Uh, and so what you're seeing in this schematic here, um, so in the G uh, a heavy chain and then the L light chain band, essentially we've precipitated out a monoclonal protein. So we know this patient, you know, has an IgG lambda. So you'll see the report come back, you know, identifying this. So up to the, the kind of uh, upper right uh, quadrant here is specifically um, referring to the immunoglobulin-free light chain uh, assay. And so there's a number of different proprietary assays out there. The first one on the, the scene is called the free light assay uh, by a company called the Binding Insight. And ultimately, what they're taking advantage of is the fact that, you know, I pointed out in these earlier constructs, you know, we have a light chain bound to a heavy chain, and that's where most of our light chains circulate, but we also have soluble free light chains. So as it goes to tell you, there's no heavy chain bound to it. And historically, before about the early, you know, 2010s, uh, around that time is really when these assays became readily clinically available. But before that, the way that you needed to find free light chains was, as this term we're probably all familiar with, is Bench-Jones proteins. These are, these are light chains in the urine, and so the 24-hour urine protein electrophoresis plus the immunofixation was the way we found free light chains. Um, so now we're, we're privileged that we can actually have a readily available tool um, from the, the blood work to identify this. But I would say the downside or, you know, some of the hazards of relying only on the free light chain assay is that there are many uh, false positives. So as you heard a moment ago, um, you know, physiologic uh, increase in kappa light chains especially is common with renal impairment. The other thing increasingly I'm seeing is I think with the rise of the obesity epidemic, many patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease uh, ultimately have what we term polyclonal hypergammaglobulinemia uh, because of, of kind of the hepatic inflammation. And so we also see, you know, abnormal um, light chain ratios commonly in that population. So it's a very sensitive tool, but it's less specific. Um, and so that's where ultimately the urine immunofixation is still really, really helpful because what you can sometimes see is a mildly abnormal free light chain ratio, but their, their urine immunofixation comes back negative, and that's oftentimes reassuring. Um, and so, you know, this is just a schematic that I think kind of tries to illustrate where these ratios are coming from. We all make kappa and lambda light chains. They're part of our, our, our normal immune system. Normally we have this tight band and depending on the, you know, the, the center that you're at, they'll publish their reference range, but around one and a half is sort of the upper limit of, of normal uh, down to all the way to 0 0.5. That renal reference range that we, as we call it, you know, can go all the way up to about three to 3.1 for a, a, a someone who has renal impairment. But if we're overproducing kappas, we're overproducing lambdas, that's where, you know, kind of that teeter-totter starts to, to shift and you'll see you know, marked elevation of either your kappas or suppression uh, with, with your lambdas. 
And I kind of point out, once we have a patient who has known monoclonal gammopathy, knowing what they're involved, light chain is actually really helpful for monitoring. So especially for our amyloid patients who've gone through therapy, seen some patients, you know, just recently, for example, their lambda was their involved uh, protein. They're on surveillance, they're in, they're in remission, um, they get a vaccine, they get COVID, they, you know, they are dehydrated when they do their labs, and their labs come back and they have a mildly elevated kappa lambda free light chain ratio, and they see that number in the portal, and they're panicked because they're like, I'm, I, I'm out of remission. But knowing that patient had lambda free light chains, I don't, I don't worry if their kappa lambda ratio is a little high because it's their kappas that are up, because I know it's not from their amyloid, it's a physiologic factor. So these are just some of the, the nuances. It's a test that requires some interpretation, and so that's really where, you know, Pairing with a hematologist you trust that it can help kind of decipher some of this. So, you know, with the bone marrow aspirate biopsy, you know, I, I've kind of quoted a roughly 90% sensitivity that might overshoot it a little bit when we combine a fat aspirate plus a bone marrow biopsy. A lot of this comes from older Mayo data that was looking at in house, the, as we so quote unquote call the Mayo Clinic experience. I, I think one thing that is a little bit to me, um, you know, put sort of an asterisk on this because these are very experienced pathologists who are sort of, they're all tuned in to amyloidosis. The, the, uh, the providers who are doing the fat aspirates are tuned into knowing how to properly uh, get the, the tissue that's needed. Um, so in, in less experienced hands, we know that, that, you know, these things, even if the right tests are done, you know, can be missed. Um, you know, and again, I kind of highlighted earlier with the greater than 10% plasma cells is, is a higher risk factor. We'll do fish testing, and as a hematologist treating these patients in that you know population that have the translocation identified here, it's a helpful tool. It actually predicts therapeutic response to one of the, the oral therapies that can be used uh, subsequently. Um, whoops, wrong button. Sorry. Um, so this is, I guess, my plug to sort of know your reference lab. So know what system you're working in, as you, you heard earlier. Um, kind of set up your order set. I think that's a perfect, perfect uh, you know advice. Because even in town, I'm just, you know, representing two, two major labs. So, you know, in-house at Mayo, there is a, a whole panel. We call it the monoclonal gammopathy diagnostic serum. And what it is, it's an SPEP. It's an immunofixation, which we've now shifted to a, a newer uh, form of that. It's also mass spec based. Uh, based. We call it Maldi-TOF, um, but a little bit more, more sensitive. But essentially, it's, it's an SPEP plus a serum immunofixation plus a free light chain. So one test one order, I should say, and you get, you get all three of those. Um, and then we also do advocate for doing urine immunofixation. I'm a realist, and so I know that it's a big ask for my cardiology providers. If you're seeing a patient that's got a mildly abnormal echo, you, you're concerned about amyloid, but you're not quite sure, it's a big ask for, to, you know, to tell you to collect a random 24-hour you know, urine and immunofixation. So I'm a realist, so even you know, spot protein with a urine immunofixation, I think that's a good start. You're gonna miss very few patients if you've done those top three blood tests, very few patients are going to be missed with, um, you know, with just a random urine immunofixation on top. So, so that would be, you know, a common test uh, panel to order. Whereas, you know, with Sonora Quest, um, their nomenclature is a little bit bizarre. So, you know, monoclonal gammopathy DX PNL. So, I guess diagnostic panel, comma AL Amy uh, is is the test ID. And so, with that, you actually get um, all four. So, serum, uh, those three key tests that we talked about plus uh, uh, urine protein electrophoresis and immune fixation. But it depends on where you're, where you're at. We call these same tests different things in, in different sites. So kind of knowing what your you know, in-house uh, tests are called and then save that uh, to save yourself some pain. So this is a, a kind of a, a, a flow for, that comes actually off of the Mayo Clinic labs. I like this schematic. And this is something that's online available. It's, and you can actually click into it and it will tell you more about each of these tests. Um, so that's out there for, for everyone's reference. But in that scenario, you have a clinical pattern that you're concerned, you're gonna initiate monoclonal protein testing, and one of those tests come back with an abnormality. So it's an immunofixation that's positive, it's an abnormal free light chain. The you know, next step obviously would be to involve a hematologist, and in our practice, uh, traditionally we do those two tests listed here. So the bone marrow aspirate and a fat pad biopsy or fat aspirate both of those with Congo red staining, looking for this, knowing that that's not the end all be all. So in those patients, you have a high suspicion for amyloid. You know, if those tests are positive, perfect, we have a diagnosis. But if those tests come back inconclusive or negative, you know, you see the plasma cells, but you don't see the amyloid, 
that's where as you're, you're highlighting here, our next step would be an affected organ biopsy. And, and it really kind of depends on how these patients flow into a hematology clinic. There are patients who come to me as MGUS and they're undifferentiated and that's where I'm the one kind of directing some of this. But I also meet, you know, many patients who've also, you know, they've already gone through this whole pathway. Uh, our cardiologist uh, colleagues, colleagues have handed this over on a silver platter and you guys have already done the, the work. So, um, so it kind of just depends on where this patient enters in. You've heard about this nicely today. I kind of highlight this is this is a throwback. So Dr. Gertz who, and Dr. Kyle, who I, I kind of think of the sort of the, the Mayo, you know, goats of, of amyloid here. Um, you know, at 1987, we're publishing, you know, screening uh, PYP scans for cardiac amyloid. You know, the, the conclusion on this is interesting because ultimately they were saying, they were trying to say, is this a sensitive tool to pick up cardiac amyloid? And, and their takeaway was no, it's not a sensitive tool, but they were looking primarily at AL uh, patients. But what they could see is that a number of patients with AL will, will turn positive. So more for historical interest, but as you heard from Dr. Rosenthal earlier, probably close to a, a quarter or maybe 20% of patients with TTR amyloid may have an immunoglobulin abnormality. So, you know, again, this is one of these big clinical pearls uh, we've, we've harped on so far today is that just because there's MGUS, that does not equate to AL amyloidosis. You need to take that next step and do the amyloid subtyping. And you know, if any of you have attended uh, you know, amyloid support group meetings here locally, you know, there, are, there are some patients who routinely come there who you know, were treated for six months with Cyborg D and they had, they had, they had, uh, they had MGUS and, and they had TTR amyloid. And so that's a story that I think is unfortunately probably very common around the, the country that we obviously don't, don't want to repeat. So we have the tools to be able to decipher these. Um, and so again, this is this is the staging. This is getting a little old. I know there are some efforts uh, underway to to likely refine this um, this schema, and I think these overall survival numbers are also very outdated, given the fact that um, ultimately our, our tools have improved quite quite a lot over the last decade. Uh, but this goes to highlight the more cardiac involvement, uh, the the worse the prognosis historically is, and, and we're still lacking, especially in those stage four patients. So with those two readily available cardiac biomarkers, the NT-pro BNP, the high sensitivity troponin, and then we also factor in their light chain burden, so that DFLC that I referred to earlier. So with those three things, you can stratify this into a four uh, stage uh, group. Um, and so we are, we are absolutely, uh, you know, I think, improving outcomes a uh, big picture. So, you know, this would say a patient with stage one amyloid, for example, they have one risk factor in this, this data, you know, was saying about three and a half years. I, I think we're, we're doing a lot, lot better there, but, but ultimately the takeaway is, is that the more advanced cardiac involvement, uh, the worse the prognosis is, so, so early diagnosis again. So I, I, my talk today, you know, out of scope to really get into the nitty gritty of, of detail. Um, you know, a lot of these medicines are borrowed from multiple myeloma, but the big thing that I would point out, especially that red column, the IMIDs, which, uh, you know, two of the medicines you're likely very familiar with, so uh, thalidomide, just from obviously its, it's uh, notoriety, and then with lenalid lenalidomide, which is more commonly, you know, used today in the United States, and then a subsequent version of pomalidomide. They're a workhorse in multiple myeloma, but in amyloidosis, they're oftentimes not well tolerated. And actually, some of the early trials that, you know, in, in myeloma, lenalidomide dexamethasone was a, was a blockbuster combination that improved outcomes a lot. When they said, okay, how does this work in AL amyloid, the trials were actually shut down early because of excess death on the, the intervention arm with Lendex. And it turns out patients with AL amyloid, especially with cardiac involvement, do not tolerate full, do full dose lenalidomide and full dose dexamethasone. So, you know, the reason I put this slide in is that there are nuances here. So the, the hazard of labeling a patient with multiple myeloma and going down that pathway of revlimid velcade dexamethasone and they're getting blasted with corticosteroids, the wheels fall off pretty fast in those patients if, you know, as a hematologist, uh, no one really thinks about, you know, the amyloid, uh, you know, underlying diagnosis here. Dr. Rosenthal, again, kind of hinted at this with the Andromeda study. The reason I kind of uh, highlight this is that hematologic response, essentially everyone has benefit. So, and these are very deep responses. You heard more than half of patients actually get to the point where their monoclonal protein is entirely undetectable. So we call that a, a hematologic complete response. But the other thing that's really, really uh, impressive is when we actually translate that to organ response, which is ultimately what we really care about. Um, you can see four out of five patients have significant renal recovery. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, and when we look at the cardiac population, more than half of patients saw a cardiac response, and that's more than twofold higher than what we saw with, with Cyborg D. So just with the addition of a, a monoclonal antibody that really honestly adds very few side effects, can really move the needle uh, for, for patients. Uh, but again, it's, it's those patients who are detected early on who, who really maximally benefit. So, you know, with, with conclusions here, um, you know, we've kind of harped on this again. The early diagnosis is, is key. And so hopefully as, as a, a medical community, we'll continue to improve there. You know, I, I sometimes think amyloid is the perfect um, syndrome that, you know, AI ultimately will, will likely help us. I just heard a recent story of a mother, you know, on chat GPT entering the daughter, her daughter's symptoms, she had a rare neurologic degenerative order, you know, d disorder, and she had seen countless, you know, neurologists, neurosurgeons, and ultimately uh, chat GPT suggested the diagnosis after, after her mother entered this slew of signs and symptoms from her medical report. So I, I think amyloid in some, some respects, you know, could be similar because it's all these various different, different clues and sort of seeing the forest, you know, in the trees. Um, screening alg algorithm we talked about, so the, the SPEP, you need an immunofixation of the serum, you need an immunofixation of the urine and the serum-free light chain. And so if you can do those, those, those key tests, um, you know, that's going to be huge for, for detecting these patients earlier on. And then ultimately, uh, you're going to hear more about the tissue biopsy in, in a moment, but um, uh, our, our pathway is, is to suggest doing a bone marrow biopsy plus an abdominal fast fat pat aspirate knowing that a bone marrow with Congo red staining is not enough. Um, the fat aspirate will pick up additional patients, but you know, probably close to you know, one-fifth, maybe even one-fourth patients, you'll still need to go on and do targeted end organ biopsy. Um, so the key thing from a provider standpoint is knowing that if that, if that bone marrow or if that fat pad comes back negative, to not stop there uh, in those patients with high suspicion. So with that, I will, will close. Thank you so much.